This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. This is the TED Radio Hour. Each week, groundbreaking TED Talks. TED Talks. Uh, TED. TED. Technology. Entertainment. Design. Design. Is that really what it stands for? <laughs> I've never known that Delivered at TED conferences. conferences around the world. It's the gift of the human imagination. We've had to believe in impossible things. The true nature of reality beckons from just beyond. Those talks, those ideas, adapted for radio. From NPR. I'm Guy Raz. Coming up... Why would somebody risk their life to help a stranger anonymously? It's a sense that they are required to help to do the most that they can. They all just say, I need to make up or, you know, give back to society. How can I do the most good? This episode, ideas about altruism. First, this news. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. So back in the mid-1990s... I was 19. Abigail Marsh was driving home to Tacoma, Washington. And Abigail, you actually go by Abby, right? I do, yeah. I go by Abby in person. Only, like, high school teachers call you Abigail. That's right. And British people. And British people, right. (laughs) So on that drive home on the Interstate 5 freeway... It's a big, busy freeway, biggest in the state. Abby experienced something that has stayed with her ever since. It was around midnight, and I was crossing over a bridge, and a little dog darted out in front of my car. I was still a pretty new driver, and I did the thing you're not supposed to do, which is swerve to try to avoid it. And uh, the combination of uh, swerving and then unfortunately hitting it anyways sent the car into a spin across the freeway until it finally came to a stop in the fast lane. So the car comes to a halt, and Mm -hmm. what's the next thing you remember? Well, I remember that it had died, and I don't know why the engine would die from doing donuts, but it did. I remember the windows were down because it was a summer night, and I heard a knock on the passenger side, and I turn, and I see a man standing there, and he just, all he said was, you look like you could do some help. Can I come get in your car? So I said, okay, and then he hopped in the car, figured out it was still in drive, which is why it wouldn't uh, turn on, and then gunned us across the freeway and parked behind his own car, which uh, I I remember being a nice BMW. And then he um, looked at me and he was like, you going to be okay? You need me to follow you for a little bit? And all I can remember saying is, no, I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, you take care of yourself. And he got out and hopped back in his car and drove off. It had always sort of been in the back of my mind because it was such a puzzle, Uh, as I think it is for a lot of people. Why would somebody risk their life to help a stranger anonymously and, you know, clearly with no hope in it for any kind of acclaim or payoff at all? And and he took real risks. And so it just, uh, you know, why would anybody do that? On the show today, ideas about why we help others. What motivates us to do it? And why are some people just more altruistic than the rest of us? Like the man who helped Abby, who darted in and out of traffic on a freeway to save someone he didn't even know. And by the way, Abby, can you tell us what you, what you do now for a living? Yeah, I'm a psychology professor at Georgetown University. And uh, you are kind of, I guess, kind of best known for studying what? Uh, both psychopathy and altruism, I'd say. Here's Abby Marsh on the TED stage. The events of that night changed the course of my life to some degree. I became a psychology researcher, and I've devoted my work to understanding the human capacity to care for others. The actions of the man who rescued me meet the most stringent definition of altruism, which is a voluntary, costly behavior 
motivated by the desire to help another individual. So it's a selfless act intended to benefit only the other. What could possibly explain an action like that? One answer is compassion, obviously, which is a key driver of altruism. But then the question becomes, why do some people seem to have more of it than others? And the answer may be that the brains of highly altruistic people are different in fundamental ways. But to figure out how, I actually started from the opposite end, with psychopaths. <laughs> a common approach to understanding basic aspects of human nature, like the desire to help other people, is to study people in whom that desire is missing. And psychopaths are exactly such a group. So they are characterized by a lot of things, but some of the most consistent findings about them is that they're very bad at recognizing fearful facial expressions. So basically, if they see somebody in a vulnerable situation, mm -hmm. they doesn't compute? Yeah. Huh. And there's a region of the brain under the cortex called the amygdala that we've known for a long time is really important for recognizing other people's fear because hmm. people who have lesions in this area show very specific selective deficits in recognizing other people's fear. And what does the amygdala look like in psychopaths? Uh, so in people who are psychopathic, it tends to be too small, sometimes maybe 20% smaller than that of healthy people. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And we know from brain imaging studies that most people show a strong increase in activation in the amygdala when they look at somebody who's afraid, whereas people who are psychopathic don't. Okay, so that was your baseline. And then mm -hmm. what was your theory that you came up with? Well, over the years, people have been coming to the conclusion that it's not like there's two kinds of people in the world, psychopaths and everybody else. Yeah. Psychopathy, like a lot of psychological disorders, exists on a continuum where you can have people at the very far end who are sort of maximally psychopathic and then people who are just a little psychopathic and then the bulk of people in the middle who are not particularly psychopathic. Right. But that continuum suggests that might be only half the equation. It might be that the continuum keeps going in the other direction so that you have highly psychopathic people on one end, average people in the middle, and then maybe on the other end you have people who are anti-psychopathic, who are unusually sensitive to other people's distress and unusually caring. And so that suggested to me that maybe if you studied people who were extraordinarily altruistic, their brains would look kind of like anti-psychopathic brains. Abby wanted to test this theory out, so she gathered a group of people you might call extraordinary altruists. Put a bunch of recruitment advertisements out on living kidney donor listservs. Basically, people who had donated a kidney to a complete stranger. And we flew about 20 of them into Georgetown and put them in the MRI scanner. And she tracked their brain activity, all while showing them the same photos that they had used with the group of psychopaths. We showed them uh, pictures of fearful facial expressions. And then you measured how their amygdala reacted or the activity? Exactly. Exactly. So the fMRI measures blood flow in the brain. And so we, we looked to see if there was an increase in how much blood was recruited to the amygdala. And did you see like wildly active levels? <laughs> we saw increases in activation mm. in the amygdala. It wasn't like they were totally non-overlapping distributions. Yeah. Um, but yes, on average, when we looked at 20 adults who had never donated a kidney to anybody, but were similar to the altruist in every other way that we could think of measuring. On average, the altruist showed uh, increased amygdala activity relative to those controls. And what about Just, size? And it was bigger, too. So their amygdalas were 8% bigger than the controls were on average. But I should add that what makes extraordinary altruists so different is not just that they're more compassionate than average. They are. But what's even more unusual about them is that they're compassionate and altruistic, not just towards people who are in their own innermost circle of friends and family. Right? Because to have compassion for people that you love and identify with is not, it's not extraordinary. Truly extraordinary altruist compassion extends way beyond that circle. And I've had the opportunity now to ask a lot of altruistic kidney donors how it is that they manage to generate such a wide circle of compassion that they were willing to give a complete stranger their kidney. And I found it's a really difficult question for them to answer. I say, you know, how is it that you're willing to do this thing when so many other people don't? You're one of fewer than 2,000 Americans who's ever given a kidney to a stranger. What is it that makes you so special? And what do they say? They say, nothing. There's nothing special about me. I'm just the same as everybody else. 
so is there a strong biological component to altruistic behavior? In other words, I mean, is it connected to this idea that we need to perpetuate um, and strengthen um, our species? We, we need to, to make sure it survives, and therefore we behave this way because we assume others will behave this way towards us in times of need? So the idea is that because, you know, we humans, we're group living species and really very sort of physically vulnerable. Uh, and so, yes, as a species, we, we never would have survived unless we had developed these strong impulses to provide care for the vulnerable and the needy. So those capacities exist, but it gives us the capacity to feel true care for others' uh, welfare at a psychological level that doesn't have any you know, this is going to benefit me in the long run. How do other species demonstrate altruism? Uh, well, there have been some really cool studies looking at altruistic behavior in rats, where rats will help one another uh, when they're trapped in water or trapped in little confining Ugh. tubes. <laughs> rats, I don't work with them myself, but I've mm. uh, rat researchers have convinced me that rats are pretty cool. And rats are very good mothers. There are mm. wonderful studies of how rats will walk across electrified grids to retrieve their babies. They're really oh, baby Yeah, rats. right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. A little warmer, yeah, towards rats. Yeah. So okay, so rats <laughs> rats are altruistic. What other yep. species are altruistic? A lot of the higher primates are, dolphins are, hmm. certainly dogs are. Dogs are a, a lovely example of um They love you know, puppies, just other puppies. Dogs will take care of any species you give them. But there are uh, fantastic stories of dogs that have been given baby skunks, baby owls, you name it. And they have uh, tremendous mothering instincts. It's interesting because clearly those animals are not doing it for selfish reasons. Like a dog right. is not looking after a cute little baby animal and saying, hey, you know, recognize me for all this great altruism that I'm demonstrating. Right. Like a dog is just right. doing it. It's just behaving that way. Yeah, you see this creature in need, and you you can't help but want to care for it. That's, yeah. you know, that's how people are. I would argue that almost everybody has had the experience of encountering a baby animal or a young child in need somewhere that they didn't know, and you're just instant urges to help yeah. in those circumstances. But like, yeah, but the thing that I wonder about the research that you that you carried out is, and this is the question I'm scared to ask you, is... <laughs> Does this mean that some of us are just wired to be better than others? Well, there was a big study that came out, I think it was last year, in uh, Nature Genetics that looked across all of the genetic studies that have been done across the last several decades. And they found that on average, across almost every human trait, the amount that's dictated by genetic variation is about 50%. And I think the same is probably true for altruism. In fact, there was one study. It, it was It's just one, but it did suggest that variation in human altruistic tendencies is about 50% due to genetics. But as we all know, genetics aren't destiny either. And I think it's almost certainly true that most people can become more altruistic. Really? Although the way, well, probably. I mean, hmm. we so we know that society is becoming more altruistic over time. So that suggests that this has to be something that can change. In fact, you know, we as a people in, in this sort of modern world that we live in care so much more about the welfare of strangers than we did in the past. You know, the, the fact that we care about the plight of strangers in, you know, who live thousands of miles away from us is actually something really remarkable about us. We do care. You know, maybe we can't always get our acts together to, to do what needs to be done, but it's like, yes, there are so many people suffering, but we really care about that, even though these are people we've never met and we'll never meet. And isn't that amazing that we still care? Abigail Marsh, she's a professor of psychology at Georgetown University. You can see her full talk at TED.com. On the show today, ideas about altruism. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR.
It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on the show today, ideas about altruism and whether certain people are just more altruistic by nature or whether altruism can be learned. So Cheryl, can you introduce yourself, please? My name is Dr. Cheryl Steed. I am a senior psychologist specialist at the California Men's Colony. And, and describe, describe the California Men's Colony. What, what is it? It's a medium security prison uh, for men. And we have inmates who have committed every single crime that you can think of. And prison isn't really a place where you might expect to find a whole lot of altruism. And before Cheryl started working there, she pretty much thought the same thing. Cheryl picks up the story from the TED stage. I expected to see a facility full of muscular, tattooed, intimidating young men. But I quickly realized 20% of California's male inmate population is over the age of 50. Many inmates are in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s. Eventually, many of these aging inmates will be diagnosed with dementia. Take a moment and imagine what this would be like for someone with dementia to live in such an environment and not remember how you got there or why when you can go home or even if you can go home. Keeping elderly inmates, especially those with dementia, safe and healthy is an enormous task. But at the men's colony, someone did tackle this challenge about 20 years ago. Catherine Evans was a visionary recreational therapist. She created the Gold Coat Program. They assign high-functioning general population inmates to serve as assistant caregivers to some of the prison's most vulnerable populations. They're called gold coats because the inmates wear gold-colored jackets over their blue prison uniforms. Today, 20 years later, the gold coat program is under Cheryl's direction. And she says the day-to-day job of a gold coat in prison is a lot like the job of a caregiver anywhere else. They get up every single morning, nice and early, uh, go and assist the inmates who need the help with uh, getting up, getting dressed. They escort them to the dining hall and sit at the tables with them to help them, you know, open the milk carton and encourage them to eat. And throughout the day, they escort them to their various appointments that they have, medical appointments, take them to the library, help them, you know, write a letter to family or just walk laps with them. You know, if somebody has an accident because they're incontinent, they'll help them get back to their room and get changed and cleaned up, that kind of thing. They assist them and and coach them and guide them and act as a presence with them throughout the entire process. And and the Gold Coats, why why are they in prison? All of the ones that I work with are, are incarcerated for murder. Many of us as outside observers would have a hard time reconciling these men's two identities. Someone who is capable of committing a horrific crime against another human being and somebody who helps gently guide an elderly man through the process of showering, dressing, and eating. Being a gold coat, as with any caregiver, requires incredible patience, flexibility, frustration tolerance. For these men, these attributes were not part of their skill set at the time they committed their crime. But the benefits of the Gold Coat program don't stop with the inmates who receive the assistance. The program has a significant positive impact on the Gold Coats themselves. The experience can be incredibly transformative. It sounds like they've become more altruistic by, you know, by helping other people who are vulnerable. Absolutely. They talk about, you know, developing patience and tolerance and empathy. You know, they they talk about how in their younger days they would have seen somebody who is mentally ill or demented and they would not have taken the time to understand that or figure out if they needed to help. They would have just, that guy's crazy kind of thing. Hmm. They've learned 
why that person really needs help as opposed to somebody turning away from them. I mean, these are prisoners who committed murder when they were younger, and they are now in a position where they are showing incredible empathy and kindness. Mm -hmm. And patience, yeah. What motivates them? What When you ask them, why do you do this? What do they tell you? You know, the overarching reason that I hear from the inmates is they want to give back for their crime. Hmm. They do get paid a very small amount of money for their scheduled hours, which is just, you know, a Monday through Friday, regular workday kind of hours. But I, I don't think they see it that way. You know, they all just say, I need to make up or, you know, give back to society for what I did. And this is one way that I know how to do that. You know, I, I guess somebody hearing this could say, well, I'm not really sure if this is a selfless act because they have special privileges and these gold coats are being paid and maybe they'll, they will get, you know, some benefit when they're up for parole. But, but I wonder whether over time what they do does become an act of selflessness. I think it really does, and I think that's demonstrated in their their willingness to volunteer outside of their regular work hours. And while they do get paid, it's a very small amount of money. They get paid 24 cents an hour, uh, which comes out to $36 a month. And there are, it is by far not the highest paying job in the prison, hmm. and they work much harder for a lot less money than a lot of inmates do. Um, some other inmates sometimes give them a hard time and say, oh, you're just doing that so that the parole board will view you favorably. But it's really not, that That does not necessarily make any difference. But just the fact that they say, okay, I'm still here on the weekends, on the holidays, on the evenings, in the middle of the night, you know, that that's, to me speaks volumes about that sort of selflessness and that altruistic aspect of, of the work that they do because they nobody says that they have to do that. They just do it. And working with the Gold Coats has changed me as well. Every week I meet with incarcerated men who are finding something new in themselves, something that eludes easy categories and transcends their old identities. How do you explain the fact that a man who once took a life is now a caregiver, that someone who inflicted great pain is now dedicated to relieving pain. Which version of this person is the truth? Caregiving is exhausting, often thankless work, yet every morning these men get up to assist the inmates with dementia. Seeing the changes in them changes how I view all of us as human beings. I think, I think a lot of people think of altruism as something innate, right? But, I mean, but this seems to suggest that you can teach it, that you can, you can actually teach a grown man or woman to, to behave in this way, you know, somebody who, who maybe wouldn't be altruistic otherwise. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, I think they must just have some kernel of something there that maybe has just never been nurtured, that we nurture it. And it's through working with the Gold Coats that I've realized, whoa, you know, we can take somebody who was, you know, what people would call a hardened criminal or, you know, a murderer or something like that, and bring this whole different aspect of themselves to light. They talk about, you know, developing empathy and and realizing, oh, you know, my behavior has an impact on somebody else. It's not just all about me. <laughs> it's, huh. it's about somebody else and somebody else's needs before mine. It certainly challenged my assumption when I first walked in the door of, you know, gosh, these are just all criminals. Huh. They're not. They're human beings. Yeah. And it's really important to remember that. Cheryl Steed, she's senior psychologist at the California Men's Colony in Central California. You can see that full talk at tedmed.com. Uh, I want to ask you about this really famous Talmudic notion. It actually might be in the, in the Quran as well. Uh, but this idea that, you know, if you save a single life, then, then you have saved all of humanity. Do you know that one? 
yes, I think it's Talmudic, but who knows, maybe it's in the Quran as well. And, and do you think that's just total nonsense? Sadly, yes, I do. This is the renowned and somewhat controversial philosopher Peter Singer. He teaches at Princeton. I mean, of, of course, you know, if it's encouraging people to save one person rather than not to save anyone, that's, that's a good thing. But if you really take it literally, I don't see how anyone could really think that if you have a choice between saving the life of one person and saving the lives of a million people, to say, well, I've saved the one, uh, you know, can you really take that seriously? I can't. For decades, Peter Singer has asked really big ethical questions, specifically about suffering and how we should all work to reduce it, which has brought him to a very different definition of altruism. Peter explained his idea on the TED stage by starting out with a news clip, and you might remember this. It's about a horrific incident in China a few years ago when a van ran over a toddler. Within two minutes, three people passed two-year-old Wang Yu by. The first walks around the badly injured toddler completely. Others look at her before moving off. There were other people who walked past Wang Yu before a street cleaner raised the alarm. She was rushed to hospital, but it was too late. She died. I wonder how many of you, looking at that, said to yourselves just now, I would not have done that. I would have stopped to help. As I thought, that's most of you. And I believe you, I'm sure you're right. But before you give yourself too much credit, UNICEF reports that in 2011, 6.9 million children under five died from preventable poverty-related diseases. 6.9 million is 19,000 children dying every day. Does it really matter that we're not walking past them in the street? Does it really matter that they're far away? I don't think it does make a morally relevant difference. The fact that they're not right in front of us, the fact, of course, that they're of a different nationality or race, none of that seems morally relevant to me. What is really important is, can we reduce that death toll? Can we save some of those 19,000 children dying every day? And the answer is, yes, we can. Each of us spends money on things that we do not really need. You could take the money you're spending on those unnecessary things and give it to this organization, the Against Malaria Foundation which would take the money you had given and use it to buy nets to protect children. And we know reliably that if we provide nets, they're used and they reduce the number of children dying from malaria. Fortunately, more and more people are understanding this idea and the result is a growing movement, effective altruism. It's important because it combines both the heart and the head. The heart, of course, you felt. You felt the empathy for that child. But it's really important to use the head as well to make sure that what you do is effective and well-directed. For Peter, effective altruism is the most efficient way of giving money that will have the maximum impact and benefit which means finding organizations that will make the most out of your contribution 
to save the most lives or to alleviate the most amount of suffering. Most people don't think about that. And they don't realize that uh, if they thought a little bit about which charity they ought to direct their time and money and resources to, they could do 10 times, perhaps 100 times, perhaps in some cases even 1,000 times as much good. Charitable giving is a huge sector in the United States. It, it amounts to $350 billion a year. And yet I, I can't help feeling that a lot of that is wasted because people have not been thinking about how to do it as effectively as possible. Take, for example, providing a guide dog for a blind person. That's a good thing to do, right? Well, right, it is a good thing to do. But you have to think what else you could do with the resources. It costs about $40,000 to train a guide dog and train the recipient so that the guide dog can be an effective help to a blind person. It costs somewhere between $20 and $50 to cure a blind person in a developing country if they have trachoma. So you do the sums, and you could provide one guide dog for one blind American, or you could cure between 400 and 2,000 people of blindness. I think it's clear what's the better thing to do. This is the website of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and if you look at the words on the top right-hand side, it says, all lives have equal value. That's the rational understanding of our situation in the world that has led to these people being the most effective altruists in history, Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett. No one, not Andrew Carnegie, not John D. Rockefeller, has ever given as much to charity as each one of these three, and they have used their intelligence to make sure that it is highly effective. According to one estimate, the Gates Foundation has already saved 5.8 million lives and many millions more people getting diseases that would have made them very sick, even if eventually they survived. Over the coming years, undoubtedly, the Gates Foundation is going to save a lot more lives. All right, so, so I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted over this idea that, you know, on the one hand, people like Bill and Melinda Gates, who, who I should add also contribute to NPR, uh, you know, or Warren Buffett, they've done so much incredible work to, to alleviate global poverty. But on the other hand, I mean, I think the, the amount they've given isn't really a sacrifice for them, right? Because it, it probably hasn't made much of a difference in the way they live their lives. You know what I mean? Oh, I do know what you mean exactly. And I, I agree. I think Bill Gates has given away... 25 billion, but he still got more money than he could possibly really spend. Uh, and the same for Warren Buffett. But um, I still think we ought to praise Gates and Buffett for the amount of good that they've done because they've set an example to others and they're influencing others as well. But but I sometimes wonder whether you know the way we venerate our wealthy philanthropists it kind of takes the shine off the altruism. You know, like like wouldn't it be a higher form of altruism if someone gave a lot without receiving you know any kind of recognition? I don't take that view about motivation. I'm more interested in outcomes than I am in the question of who is the purest and most noble altruist of all. Hmm. Um, you know, I think they were all motivated by the idea of doing good. And uh, I'd much rather be part of a society which greatly honors and respects people who are altruists and who are effective in their altruism than one that either admires people because they're you know, celebrity movie stars or because they're super wealthy just no matter what they do with their wealth because I think we ought to try to encourage more people to act in that way. In a moment, philosopher Peter Singer on how all of us could be effective altruists. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR.
It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on the show today, ideas about altruism from extraordinary altruists who have given a kidney to a complete stranger to effective altruists like philosopher Peter Singer. Effective altruism is a form of altruism in which we bring our rational capacities to bear in order to do the most good that we can. And you don't need to be a billionaire like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett to be an effective altruist. In fact, you can choose to live on a modest income and then give the rest away. Or you can choose what Peter calls an ethical career. In terms of how can I do the most good? What is the most ethical career for me to enter into? And Peter's definition includes what you might normally think of as ethical, like studying medicine and then working in a developing country or becoming an aid worker. But it also includes careers that you might not normally think of, like becoming a Wall Street banker. If you have the abilities to earn a lot of money and if you have the character to persist in giving that to the most effective charities you can find, then that may be the best thing that you can do. Um, And... Uh, Also, if you do become a Wall Street banker, I think you need to be aware of what you're doing in terms of your daily work, not just earning money to give a lot away, but you need to think about, am I harming people through the work that I'm doing? Okay, so let's say, you know, you're a highly paid Wall Street banker and, you know, your work is kind of neutral. You're not harming anyone. You're, you know, you're giving away a lot of your money to effective charities. And let's say you're thinking about, you know, taking an hour to work in a soup kitchen would it be better to work that hour in a soup kitchen or just, you know, donate the money? Well, if I'm a highly paid uh, Wall Street worker and uh, I'm losing many hundreds of dollars, perhaps even thousands, by uh, going to work for the soup kitchen, then it would be better for me to keep working. Um, you know, now, you know, maybe I feel I need a break from the office. Maybe I feel I need to meet some real people outside my Wall Street bubble. You know, you can think of stories as to why it would be good for me. Sure. But, but in terms of the difference I make by ladling out soup, um, no. It, you know, it would be much better for me to donate to the organization so it could employ somebody to uh, ladle out the soup while I continue to earn my hundreds of dollars an hour and have more to give. But Peter, I mean, you could have chosen a career – you know, where you would have made a lot more money and then you could have given away a lot more money, right? I mean, but but you didn't. And and I mean, who knows? You, you've you probably had a lot of influence on people through your writing and teaching. Um, but I mean, do, do you, you know what I mean? Yes, you're, you're right about that. Um, looking back on my career, I think I've been extremely fortunate to be in the right place at the right time in order to have the influence that I did. But, but I mean, couldn't you argue that that your decision to become a philosopher was a a selfish act. Um, Why exactly a selfish act? I mean, I'm not denying that it was, but why are you saying that? (laughs) Because you could have, because if you could have made a lot more money doing something else, you could have given a lot more money away. Oh, that's true. Um, But on the other hand, I wouldn't have had the influence that I've had through my writing. But you didn't know that. You didn't know that going into it. I didn't. Absolutely, I didn't. And, And, you know, if you're asking me what were my actual motivations then I just found philosophy very interesting. Um, Hmm. That's true. So, um, yeah, you could say that my motivation was not the best. And if I'd thought about the possibility of going into business to earn a lot of money and give it away, that that would have been a more reasonable choice for me to make at the time. Um, I didn't even think about that either, I have to say. Um, I wasn't really uh, thinking that that ethically uh, as I should have been at the time. Um. Earlier, Peter, you mentioned the the $350 billion a year in charitable contributions that are given away uh, just in the U.S. alone. And I'm just wondering if everyone who gives money were to practice effective altruism, you know, could we resolve some of the biggest problems we face? We certainly would resolve uh, the problems of the charities that are working in areas where they can do the most good. So if you consider that the U.S. uh, foreign aid budget is uh, $30 billion. Yes, we could make a a major contribution to reducing global poverty, start to deal much better with some of the other big environmental problems that the world faces. Uh, So I think we could solve a lot of problems. Philosopher Peter Singer, he teaches at Princeton University. You can watch his entire talk as well as find resources on effective charities at TED.com.
Most of us feel that we want to spend our lives doing the right thing. But um, certainly for my purposes, I was more interested in people who give until it hurts. This is Larissa McFarquhar. She's a staff writer at The New Yorker. And Larissa spent years researching and writing about extreme altruists, people who devote their entire lives to helping others, even if it means putting themselves at risk. It's a sense that they are required to help, that a life of duty um, requires them to do the most that they can. They don't wait for something to to be thrust upon them. They calculate, they plan, they go out looking for trouble. Like in the case of one man Larissa wrote about, a man named Baba Amte. He, uh had been a lawyer. He grew up as a very um, rich young man and kind of a playboy in um, in India, and in the right in the center of India, in Nagpur. And he one day was walking along in the rain when he saw a leper lying by the side of the road. And this man was in the last stages of the disease, crawling with maggots, flesh caved in. And he was horrified by this sight, and he was scared of catching the disease, so he ran away which would be the end of the story for a lot of people. But what happened next would completely redefine Baba Amte's life. The thing about Baba Amte is that he was a very macho guy. He was always fighting. Being a a courageous macho guy was at the core of his self-image. So when he realized that he'd run away, he'd been a coward, he couldn't stand this thought. And he decided that he would have to, in order to restore his sense of self, of himself as this... Uh, brave man, he would have to steer right into this fear. And so the first thing he did was go back to that uh, man by the side of the road, and there wasn't much he could do for him. He was almost dead, but he covered him to protect him from the rain. And then he made leprosy his life's work. Larissa McFarquhar picks up the story from the TED stage. The first thing he did was enroll in a school of tropical medicine. And he discovered that one of the reasons there was as yet no cure for leprosy was that it seemed to be impossible to transmit the disease to animals for the purpose of experiments. He thought about this for a day, and then he offered himself as a human experimental subject. And he was injected with the leprosy bacillus, but he didn't catch the disease. As it happened, shortly after he graduated from the school, there was a cure found, the drug Dapsone. But the symptoms of leprosy were so terrifying to people and so unmistakable that even once a cure had been found, leprosy patients had many of the same problems they'd had before. They were thrown out of their families, thrown out of their villages, forced to beg, sometimes even burned alive. And so even after a cure had been found, leprosy colonies were still necessary, and Baba decided to found one. He was given a tract of land by the state, a total wilderness, and he moved out there with several leprosy patients, his wife, their two baby sons, and four dogs to protect them from the wild animals, because at first there was nothing there at all, no no water, nothing, and they were living in shelters that had no walls. And one by one, every single one of the dogs was carried off and eaten by a panther. Baba's two baby sons were not carried off and eaten by a panther as the dogs were, but they might have been. And they did not catch leprosy, but they might have done. Now, I visited this leprosy colony uh, many decades later after he founded it, and it's now a flourishing community. It's an extraordinary place. Several thousand people live there, And this is not just a refuge for the desperate anymore. It's a place where people live their whole lives. They have children. They get married. There are many schools there. There are workshops. There's even a college. But this is what I mean when I talk about preparedness to sacrifice family for strangers. This willingness to sacrifice for a cause, many people find it strange and unnatural. And it's this sense that I think is a deeper reason why some of us don't give more than we do. I mean, to be honest, this story is kind of uncomfortable, right? I mean, like, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem right for him to have injected himself with the disease and, and, and to put his family at risk. Yeah, and that's what people have a problem with. They, they think you should draw the line somewhere. You should not be so devoted to strangers that you are prepared 
to sacrifice your family. And I think it's it's interesting to think about how we would have evaluated Baba Amte's achievement if those sons had died or gotten sick. Yeah. And that's that was the most difficult um part of altruism for everyone I spoke to was this question of how much do I give? At what point do I protect my family? Do I give to the point where not only I, but they are making unbearable sacrifices? In your book, you also talk about this extremely altruistic couple, Hector and Sue. Um, can you can you tell us about them? Hector and Sue are extraordinarily compassionate, but not in the way that most of us think of that word. It's not just a person in pain in front of them that moves them, but the idea of someone who needs their help, specifically a child who needs a family. Sue had always wanted to adopt when she grew up. She thought it would be so much fun to bring in kids who needed a family and love them and make them happy. And so when she and Hector decided to get married, they decided to have two kids and adopt two, and they did. But then they got involved in the adoption world, and they discovered how many children there are who are unlikely ever to be adopted. And when they thought, Sue and Hector thought, about all those children who were likely to spend their childhoods going from foster home to foster home to foster home, they could not bear it. And so they started to adopt more and more and more. And they ended up adopting 20 of these special needs children in addition to the two biological kids they had. And as the family grew larger, and they started asking the older kids to help take care of the younger kids, they started to complain. They said, Mom and Dad, we cannot adopt all the children in the world. You have to stop. We don't get enough of your time and attention as it is. Now, I think for most ordinary parents, that would be the end of it. It's making my kids unhappy. I'm going to stop. And this hurt Sue and Hector very deeply, too, because I want to emphasize, this was a real family. This was not an orphanage. And they loved their children as much as any parents do. But this is what makes them different. They could not stop thinking about that child out there, the child who was still a stranger to them, but who would not have a family unless they took him in. And they thought, even if it makes our children a little less happy, if it dramatically changes the life of that child, then it's worth it. Do Sue and Hector... Do they think that they live their lives in a more moral way? Are they, do they look around the world? Do they look around their communities and and sort of cast judgment on the ways other people live their lives? You know, I'm very glad you asked me about judgmentalness because I think this is another big part of why people are ambivalent about people with a very strong sense of, of moral duty. They think oh, they're, are they judgmental? Are they self-righteous? That's, that's a bad thing. And I do think we overestimate how bad being judgmental is. You know, it's annoying. People who are judgmental are annoying. But, you know, imagine somebody who spends their life uh, trying to alleviate homelessness and is kind of priggish about others who spend a lot of money on luxury goods. And then on the other hand, imagine someone who's this delightful cynic who's very fun to have dinner with but never does a thing for anyone. Do we really want to say that the second person is better because they are not judgmental? I think judgmental is an annoying quality, but it's not such a big thing. So, I mean, so maybe we can't, you know, all be like Hector and Sue, right? But, I mean, but why don't more of us do more of that? Like, why aren't why aren't we more altruistic? I think that part of the reason is that we are ambivalent towards very good people. Um, we suspect them of being puritanical, unfun, annoying. But also, I think there's a genuine ambivalence um, in most of us about what is the best way to live and what are the proper values to live by. I think that if you are a truly devoted um, altruist, you are at some point going to start giving to the point where it requires sacrifices, not only of yourself, but of your family and the people you love. And I think most of us are not sure that's the right thing to do. Is it right to give to others, to strangers, at the expense of your family, of your own people? 
People would ask Sue and Hector why they'd chosen to live the way they did. And what they didn't understand, those people, is that Sue and Hector never wanted an easy life. They didn't just love their children. They loved the challenge. They didn't just love their life in spite of its difficulties, but in part because of them. And this is another difference between people like Sue and Hector and Baba Amte and the rest of us. For them, it is always wartime. By that I mean that they know, not just intellectually, but vividly and urgently, that there is always somewhere a need for help. And they feel that even though the people who need the help may be strangers to them, they are also, in some sense, their people. The thing about Sue and Hector and Baba Amte is that they have a deep and happy sense of purpose. Of course, they have sacrificed many comforts, but in exchange, they know that they have changed many lives for the better. And they believe that they are living their own lives the way they ought to. And how many of us can say that? Thank you. Larissa McFarquhar is a staff writer at The New Yorker. Her book on this is called Strangers Drowning. You can see her entire talk at tedmed.com. Hey, thanks for listening to our show on altruism this week. If you want to find out more about who is on it, go to ted.npr.org. To see hundreds more TED Talks, check out ted.com or the TED app. Our production staff here at NPR includes Jeff Rogers, Sanaz Meshkinpour, Janae West, Neva Grant, Rund Abdel Fattah, Casey Herman, and Rachel Faulkner, with help from Thomas Liu and Daniel Shukin. Our partners at TED are Chris Anderson, Kelly Stetzel, Anna Phelan, and Janet Lee. If you want to let us know what you think about the show, you can write us at tedradiohour at npr.org. And you can follow us on Twitter. It's at TED Radio Hour. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to Ideas Worth Spreading right here on the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Yes, it's better to give than to receive. Can't I help you see the light? Everything's going to be all right. It's better. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.